Right, welcome to Bev Clarkson. Bev is the Wetland Program Leader at Manaki Whenua Landcare Research in Hamilton. Right. <clears throat> thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Joanna, for setting the scene. Um, my presentation is on reversing biodiversity decline in threatened ecosystems on the Hauraki floodplain. Now, this is part of the Living Water Program, and it, it also sits within the Bioheritage Challenge. So the Living Water is a partnership between DOC and Fonterra to improve biodiversity and water quality outcomes in five priority catchments throughout New Zealand. And Hikarangi, just north of Whangarei, is one of these catchments. So the Hikarangi floodplain, <coughs> It, it's been extensively developed mainly for dairy farming, but it is also known as a biodiversity hotspot. So at the beginning of this um, project, we did a survey of all natural habitats uh, on the floodplain to basically identify any priorities uh, for restoration. So um, the diagram there shows that prior to European settlement, the Hikarangi floodplain was essentially one large wetland. And it's formed by the Wairua River, which uh, dissects the floodplain. And the main wetland types are close to the river, are marshes, it's the green, and moving away from the river are swamps, and then the peatlands of fens and bogs. <coughs> well, currently, <coughs> we have only 3.6% of our original wetlands remaining. Um, but despite this, there are some really important habitats and ecosystems, and these are mainly in small scattered remnants uh, on farmland. There are two large dock areas, and on the left there, that's Otakaurangi Wetland in blue, and on the right is Wairua Reserve. So the current vegetation pattern, <coughs> Total forest is common on the drier banks and the levees <coughs> alongside the Wairua River. And away from this, uh, Kahikatea forest, um, swamp forest, dominates the back swamps. And in wetter areas, swamps are of Carex uh, or Raupo and other species. So moving away further from the river, away from the influence of the flooding, sediment inputs, uh, nutrient inputs, peat starts to develop. Initially, is fens of manuka and tangle fern and then later as bogs. And the two main peat formers are wire rush and the late successional cane rush. Now because of the age of the bogs, they are several thousand years old, we would have expected to see cane rush, we expected that to still be present, but in our survey we did not find cane rush and we only found small pockets of the wire rush. So we identified two main ecosystems that were under serious threat of decline. The first one is the lowland forest, and the ecological decline has been driven by weed invasion, and this prevents the regeneration of the native forest species. Um, for the raised peat bog, we have loss of keystone species, loss of the, uh, the peat formers, and this results in the decomposition of the peat, so carbon is pumped into the atmosphere, and also loss of additional bog species. So these are the two restoration experiments I'm going to talk about in my uh, presentation. So this is a typical picture of lowland forest. Um, it's been invaded by Tradescantia fluminensis, and it forms dense covers up to about one metre in height. And Cattle do eat the Tradescantia, but the trouble is they just eat everything else. So, and if they're fenced to exclude stock, we just get this rampant growth of the Tradescantia. So what to do? So, well, let's bring in the artillery. We've got Tradescantia biocontrol beetles from Brazil, and there's three species, and they attack different parts of the plants. So these species have been released separately um, in New Zealand, elsewhere in New Zealand, but this, in our project, is the first combination release of all the three beetle species together. So it's a triple whammy to maximise the impact. And the beetles will also provide a source population for wider control of the Tradescantia on the Hikarangi floodplain. So the troops have nicknames, so these stripy, that attacks the tip of the Tradescantia, knobbly eats the leaf, and shiny um, eats the stems. 
So we set up a restoration experiment in forest remnants on farmland and in the dock reserve. At each site we have three treatments, one's the biocontrol beetle, one's hand clear, which is the traditional community group, the labour intensive method, and the control or do nothing approach. And we measured vegetation and vertebrates and environmental parameters such as nutrients and so on. So this experiment has been going for just over one year. And this is the setup. And um, on the bottom left, we are releasing the biocontrol beetles from their click click containers in the middle of the plot. And on the bottom right, we're hoping that once the beetles get established, this is what will happen to the Tradescantia. Right, but what is the impact of introducing exotic invertebrates on our native invertebrate population, particularly the beetles? Introducing beetles, what's the impact on our beetles? So we set up some invertebrate baselines immediately prior to the release of the bar control beetles. And we just showed that there were more beetles in the two reserve sites, Wairarua North and Wairarua South. But We'd expect this because these areas have larger tracts of forest and there's been less disturbance by stock. So we have temperature data for the last year and this shows that the hand cleared, the bed plots, these have lower uh, daily minimum temperatures but also higher daily maximum temperatures. So they go from about zero to about the mid 30s. So the Hankley plot, Hankley plots also have a greater range. Okay, so increase in the species richness of the woody seedlings. The Hankley plots, there are significantly more woody species established than the other um, treatments. But the trouble is, a lot of these are ephemeral seedlings and they may not be able to cope with the greater temperature range of the Hankley plots. So the bar control effects are slow, the beetles have established, they are eating the Tradescantia, but there's a lot more to eat. So the second experiment is the raised peat bog. This is at Otakarangi bog. And large areas of Otakarangi, um, the peat formers have been lost due to uh, drainage, but also regular fires that have occurred. So we went and collected a pet core. This pet core is five metres uh, in depth. And we <clears throat> analysed the macrofossils in the peat. And this showed us that the peat formers, the wire rush and the cane rush, were both historically pr uh, present. And these species contributed to the bulk of the peat. So therefore we know <clears throat> that this raised bogs, it was one, they were once present on the Hauraki floodplain, now the only site left is Otakairangi. The bog type was dominated by cane rush and wire rush. These are in the family Restianaceae, and that's why they're called Restiad bogs. And they form extensive raised bogs, or peat domes, uh, that were originally present north of Kaitaia down to south of Hamilton. But now there are only three sites left, and these are all in the Waikato. So the cane rush bog type is now a threatened ecosystem, and the cane rush itself is a threatened species. So we know at Otakarangi, the cane rush was historically present. The wire rush is present, but now only in very minor patches. So the project aims to restore some hydrological components, and Dave Campbell from the University of Waikato is leading this. But we also want to re-establish the peat forming processes by reintroducing the cane rush and expanding the current wire rush. And we also want to reintroduce Fred the Thread, this moth. This is probably a candidate for um, the MothNet program with Barbara Anderson. It's highly charismatic. It's bright orange. <laughs> it's reputed to be the skinniest caterpillar in the world and it lives entirely within the cane rush stems. Okay? And because the cane rush is a threatened species, Fred the Thread is a very threatened species. So we went back to Otakairangi and we measured the peat depths and also the environmental characteristics to find suitable sites for reintroducing the cane rush. And there in the middle <coughs> of the, <coughs> the bog, 
there's a patches of wire rush and we found some old cane rush roots about 50 centimetres below the surface. So this suggests that the cane rush has only been recently uh, become extinct from the, the, the bog. So our crazy and ambitious goal is healthy peat, like the profile there on the right, and this is from Kapuatai bog uh, in the Waikato. So to conclude, uh, the forest restoration pro, uh, experiment, we're having slow progress with the biocontrol beetles, but we are in the early stages of the experiment. Um, for the bog restoration, the nutrients and other environmental characteristics are suitable for species reintroductions, and we can translocate uh, cane rush plants that have freed inside them from the Waikato through to the Otakairangi site. So these projects show early promise of reversing biodiversity decline uh, in the Hikarangi floodplain, and those are some of the target threatened species down below. And I'd just like to um, indicate that the multi-organisational partnerships have been and will continue to be critical for the success of these projects. And I want to acknowledge all the individuals, the organisations, the funders that have supported this project, and also, of course, of course uh, my co-authors. So, thank you. So, are there any questions for Bev? No. Over there. Um, this one is Empidisma robustum. Um, it used to be Empidisma minus, but then we've published a paper to show that Empidisma robustum is different from minus, and it's actually in line with the Kauri line. So north of 38 degrees, it's Empidisma robustum, so all these are robustum. South of the Kauri line, which is around just south of Hamilton, it's Empidisma minus, so they're actually two separate species. But originally they were called minus, so I didn't want to get into that too much. So, there. Um, so was, were the cane rush roots at 30 centimetres viable? No, no, they're dead. Okay. No, no. <laughs> <But> it, <laughs> they'd be about 100 and 150 years old, probably as a result of the early European land clearing. And it's fire that actually kills the species more than a change in hydrology, because the hydro hydrology changes a little bit by little bit, but fire just wipes them, and it is very sensitive to fire. It, it knocks it more than the wire rush. Okay.